Konnichiwa, my name is Eric Waite and I'm a certified sommelier with the Court of Master Sommeliers, a French wine scholar with the Wine Scholar Guild. I'm currently a diploma student with the Wine and Spirit Educational Trust. While studying for the Unit 4 exam on spirits, I fell in love with whiskey. So while I've been into wine for about 20 years, I studied uh, enology or winemaking in college and then went on to uh, get the levels two and three with the Wine and Spirit Educational Trust before becoming a certified sommelier exam. Whiskey is still uh, somewhat new to me, um, but I'm taking all my experience as a uh, student of alcoholic beverages um, and my analytical skills and apply them to whiskey with this newfound love. Um, and I kind of wish, to be perfectly honest, I wish I could put my wine studies on hold and just study whiskey for a while. I, I'm just so uh, enthralled with it. Um, in fact, in October, and I'll talk about this more later, um, I'll be flying uh, to from California to uh, Missouri to do some studying there on whiskey for a whiskey certification there. Uh, but I'll talk more about that uh, later. Um, I'm also a photographer. Um, I've done photography for several wineries, videos. Uh, I've done one for a wine show. It was called the, uh, the Wine Down. Photography for a uh, winemaker magazine. And most recently, I did a uh, photo and video shoot uh, for the La Cité du Vent in Bordeaux. Um, and for me, it's, a, it's an artistic expression to be able to um, look through a lens to get... Uh, see the beauty in something and be able to take the right shots at the right time and then be able to convey that uh, to others. Of course, you know, photos or video never really fully capture um, what you actually see when you're actually there, but it's something I, I really, really enjoy. So in previous videos, I believe it was a video, episode number 52 and episode 106, I shared some of my photography of uh, Japanese gardens here in the San Francisco Bay Area. There are four of them that I'm aware of. Um, one in San Jose, one really close to my house uh, here in Hayward, and there's one in Cupertino, and of course there is the uh, Japanese Tea Garden in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park. So that open opening uh, shots and video that you saw at the beginning of this review was from the Japanese Tea Garden uh, in San Francisco. I took those shots on Labor Day, um, which was this past Monday, and I was a little reluctant to go out to the city, you know, because all the tourism, people have the day off. I didn't know what the crowds would be like, but the park opens up at 9 o'clock, left my house at 8 o'clock, and it was absolutely amazing. I was able to get from my house to Golden Gate Park in a half an hour. Straight up to the toll booth, nobody at the toll booth it was able to drive straight through it, go over the bridge, Wind my way through the city, get to the park, absolutely uh, no traffic whatsoever. It was, it was absolutely fantastic. The weather was just spectacular. But there was a quick rush of tourists as soon, soon as the park opened. And that can be a challenge to want to get the shot that you want without, you know, a lot of people getting in the way. But I think it worked out really, really well. I, I was really happy with it. So, um, a little bit about the park. Um, the Japanese Tea Garden located inside Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, is the oldest public Japanese garden in the United States. It was originally created as a Japanese village exhibit for the 1894 California Midwinter International Exposition. The site originally spanned about one acre and showcased a Japanese-style garden. When the fair closed, Japanese landscape architect um, Makato Hagawa um, and Superintendent John McLaren made an agreement that Mr. Hagarawa 
would create and maintain a permanent Japanese style garden as a gift for posterity. He became caretaker of the property, pouring all of his personal wealth, passion, and creative talents into creating a garden of utmost perfection. Mr. Hagaiwa expanded the garden to its current size of approximately five acres, where he and his family lived for many years until 1942, when they, along with approximately 120,000 Japanese Americans, were illegally forced to evacuate their homes and move into internment camps. When the war was over, the Hagawa family was not allowed to return to their home at the tea garden, and in subsequent years, many Hagawa family treasures were removed and new additions were made. Today, the Japanese tea garden features classic elements such as the arched drum bridge, pagodas, stone lanterns, uh, stepping stone paths, native Japanese plants, serene koi ponds, and a Zen garden. And the cherry blossom trees, uh, the cherries trees blossom throughout the garden in March and April. The only thing I didn't really get a good picture of uh, when I was in the garden was the um, arched bridge. There were just too many people climbing on it to get any really good shots of it. Now, um, let's get into this whiskey. Um, as I said before, if you check out episodes 52 and 106, if I recall correctly, um, I did two previous Japanese uh, whiskeys, and thus far, I've really been impressed with uh, what's coming out of Japan. This one is the, um, hopefully I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, Iwai, I-W-A-I, Tradition Japanese Whiskey. It's made by the Shinsu Mars Distillery, and it's produced and bottled by Humbo Shuzu Company Limited. And it's about 40% uh, alcohol by volume. Now, <clears throat> Hambu Shuzu, or Mars Whiskey, Iowa Japanese Tradition Whiskey, is a malt and grain blend whiskey. The blend comes from both malt and grain, and it is distilled at Japan's highest distillery, located in the mountain range of Nagano at 798 meters. The Mars Distillery was originally founded in uh, Kagoshima before it moved to Nagano. Uh, this blend is named after uh, Kichiro Ioi. I'm probably going to continue to mess this up, the pronunciation, I apologize. He is a mentor of Mas Masataka Taka Takatsuru. As a 14-year senior graduated from the same technical school, Ioi brought Takatsuru in uh, to the same brewery, then became his mentor in the company. Along with others in management, IY sent Takasuru to Scotland to learn the art of whiskey making. As the first Japanese to learn the art, Takatsuru uh, returned to Japan and presented a whiskey making report, the uh, Takatsuru note to IOI. Takatsuru later went on to found Nika uh, Whiskey, which I did a review of in a previous video, and then created Suntory Whiskey. Years after that, IOI founded Mars Shinsu Distillery with Takatsuru's notes. As the mentor of the father of Japanese whiskey, IOI is referred to by some as the silent pioneer of Japanese whiskey. Alrighty, let's get into it. So it's a dark amber in color, sort of uh, orange, uh, golden orange around the, the rim. High viscosity on the nose. It's clean with medium plus intense aromas of, you get stone fruits, um, apricot, peach, like a little bit of orange marmalade, honey, hints of um, nuts, Um, some dried floral notes, a lot of honey, some peach, a little bit of pineapple, and spice, a little uh, white pepper, cinnamon. All right, on the palate. Mm. Really tasty. 
The wine, excuse me, the whiskey is dry, but it does seem to have a little sweetness to it. There's a richness to it. Um, up front, I get so there's these dried stone fruits, so apricot, peach. Then comes, I get a little bit of pear, some uh, baked apple, and follows that is the spice and cinnamon. Then I get these um, nutty notes along with some pepper and various other spices. I'll say the whiskey is well balanced. Um, it enters in uh, smooth but sm spicy. It's smooth across the mid palate and smooth in the, in the finish. It's moderately complex, easy sipper. Um, I think this is one you could enjoy on its own, but I think it works uh, almost as a, as a dessert uh, whiskey. There does seem to be a minuscule amount of smoke to it. Not a whole lot, just a minuscule amount of smoke to it as well. And then um, on the finish, after I've swallowed, I pick up a little bit of um, chocolate notes and uh, with, with a little bit of nuts in it, that chocolatey nuttiness, um, but also just a little bit of black olive. Hmm. This is really, really, really tasty, easy drinking, uh, dangerously so. It sells um, between 47 and 50 bucks uh, American from what I've seen in uh, local stores. Score wise, I give it a good solid uh, 88, 89 points. Um, I like the Hibiki um, that I reviewed, the first uh, whiskey, uh, Japanese whiskey review that I did. I like that one uh, more than this one. But this is, this is really, really, really nice. So I want to recommend it if you can find it. All righty. That's about it for this review. If you have subscribed, I want to thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, if you haven't yet subscribed but you like watching my videos, I would appreciate it if you would subscribe. And if you like this review, give it a thumbs up. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, please do leave them down below. Um, I enjoy dialogue. I don't expect anyone to agree with me. I like the give and take and the going back and forth uh, in terms of our views and opinions. Um, I am a perpetual student. I don't know everything. Um, I am coming from more of a wine perspective and trying to understand uh, the whiskey world, um, and I'm excited about that. Um, I don't mean to become uh, or come across as overly opinionated, but there are some things I'm pretty uh, convinced of uh, regarding some issues uh, regarding whiskey. But um, always willing to listen and uh, hear uh, alternative views. So I would like to see more discussion, more dialogue, um, more opinions. Um, I watch a lot of other whiskey reviewers and I um, um, appreciate their input. I try to learn from them um, and I have a few that are my favorites. One of my favorites is uh, whiskey.com, um, and they post almost every day, and their website has a lot of really good information uh, that you can download and read. Right now, I'm looking into uh, trying to get a better understanding of independent bottlings. They have a really good article on that. There's not, in the whiskey books that I have, uh, not a lot of information, in fact, none at all, about uh, how independent bottlings uh, uh, came around, the history of them, and the difference between producer bottlings and independent bottlings. Um, I, I found some other good articles uh, online, so I'll soon be doing a little bit of uh, talking about that in one of my future whiskey reviews. I'm going to talk to some people in the whiskey industry uh, and get some inf inf input from them, and their understanding of it. Um, but it also seems like it's sort of a tapestry with a lot of loose threads. And when you start pulling, uh, it seems that uh, people will begin to get a little heated or a little, uh, little debate comes up about independent bottlings and so forth. Now, there's independent bottlings in the wine world as well, but it's very different from the whiskey world. So if you understand independent bottlings in the wine world, don't take that over into the whiskey world and assume it's the same because it's not. It's very, very, very different. Alrighty, if you know of any good resources on that topic, 
leave a note down below. I would appreciate it. All right. Until next time, cheers. I don't know.